Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest Weather Watch. Today's August 8th, and today we're going to take a look at the latest with the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. As many of you know, it has some big impacts here for the West Coast of North America. So we're going to dive into some things. We'll do a little bit of a tutorial here, and we'll see where we are and what the latest forecast from the Climate Prediction Center is as we go on into the fall and the winter months. So let's go ahead and start here, and I'm just going to click through this. And... This is an, a look at the equatorial Pacific. We've got the Hawaiian Islands there. You can see Australia to the bottom left. There's Japan to the upper left. There's Pacific Northwest. And that's what everybody wants to know is what is coming as we go through this fall and winter. So what do you notice on the map to the left? Well, this is precipitable water. So there's a lot more moisture there at the equatorial regions. You know, the sun makes contact with the earth there. And this is where we store a lot of that moisture across the warm tropics. So when this activity starts to move north towards the poles, the earth tries to to balance things out. This heat transfer tries to move northbound. You can see the mid-latitude cyclone there, atmospheric rivers, and in turn you get troughs and you get ridges downstream. And that has big impacts across the entire globe and especially for some of North America. So the warm air holds much more moisture energy versus dry air. And this is a dew point map. And you can clearly see that a lot of that moisture and that warmth is stored across the equatorial areas. So um, and again, like I mentioned, it does affect global atmospheric circulations and jet streams, which have big impacts here uh, for much of the globe. So if we take a look at um, uh, West Coast of North America, again, I'm kind of duplicating myself here. But well, what I'm trying to say is that what happens in the tropics does not stay in the tropics. As I mentioned, this heat transfer process, these... This warm air wants to move towards the polar regions and a lot of that cold air wants to spill back down and the earth is trying to balance itself out and it's just a battle it can never win. So as I showed you, there, there's some atmospheric rivers moving around. So if we take a look here across the equatorial Pacific, we measure these sea surface temperatures. There's Nino 3.4. This is the metric we use to tell if we are in El Nino, neutral, or La Nina conditions. And we're getting pretty good at forecasting where we're going to be headed as we go through the summer months and on in towards the fall and the winter months. And you can kind of see how we break down that in the standard measure is known as the Oceanic Nino Index, the ONI. So if we take a look here as well, there's a couple other ways we can look at this. There's the Southern Oscillation Index. We take the pressure anomaly over Darwin versus over Tahiti. And we can tell if we were in El Nino or neutral or La Nina conditions. There is also the Equatorial Southern Oscillation Index. It does the pressure anomaly over Indonesia and over the Eastern Pacific. And you might ask why that matters. Well, if you've got lower pressure over Tahiti, that usually means you've got some kind of El Nino condition where you got the deeper tropical convection. you got warm air trying to move off the south coast of North America and including the Nino 3.4 and you get that convection closer to North America and that can bring more of a persistent southwest jet stream. It can bring atmospheric rivers into California. It usually brings warmer winters into the Pacific Northwest, for example. And on the flip side of that, if you have the lower pressure out here in the deeper convection across the western Pacific, you get what is known as La Nina conditions and the jet stream can be enhanced coming off of of Asia. And we get this ridging out over the Pacific, which tends to bring us a bit more of a variable jet stream out of the north and northwest, which can bring us cooler than normal conditions for the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> So again, what I just talked about here, the, the lower pressure over Tahiti, this shows you El Nino conditions known as the Southern Oscillation Index. And the flip would be true uh, for La Nina. So now, as I've been mentioning here, uh, you know, we, we have global impacts if we're in La Nina and El Nino, but if, what happens if we go into neutral? Well, neutral doesn't mean we expect patterns to be close to average, so predictions become more difficult and make upcoming patterns harder to predict in advance. We may be in a neutral coming up here, but I'm going to show you some of the odds. They're starting to change as we get a little bit further into summer. So basically, you have what we were just talking about, uh, the ENSO conditions. There's also the Madden-Julian oscillation. It is kind of an interseason signal that exists out there and sometimes when these are in a phase you can get bigger impacts or if they're against each other then you can have more uh, muted impacts from either El Nino or the Madden Julian oscillation and again, this controls the Rossby wave configuration here. And you can see there would be the Pacific Northwest there. Ridging, you know, where the ridge is located, where the trough is located, has big implications on our weather here on the West Coast of North America. So, uh, again, kind of showing you this. You can see when they're out of phase, one is wet, one is dry. You can get, you know, kind of some uh, a muted signal there. But, of course, when you're in phase, you can enhance some of the signaling here as well. So now the Madden-Julian Oscillation moves around the planet, cycling about 30 to 60 days. It's an area of enhanced convection that moves across the equatorial Pacific from west to east across the globe. 
So again, you can kind of that stormy wet. This will move across the globe, and this kind of works inside the in, the interseasonal uh, signal there versus El Nino, which is kind of more of an entire seasonal signal that goes on. But this is why during an El Nino or a La Nina, you can still get patterns of warmer than normal or cooler than normal or cold air outbreaks in the Pacific Northwest, or even some at times or more drier than normal as well. And it just depends on what's going on out there across the equatorial Pacific a lot of the time. And then you can kind of see this is the Madden Julian oscillation moving across the equatorial Pacific. So I know what everybody wants to know. We're going to go over that here in a moment. What is the forecast coming up here through this fall and winter? Uh, but right now, if we're looking at the Madden Julian oscillation, it was in phase one here, moving across Western Hemisphere and Africa. Then it comes back out of the Pacific Ocean, and then it eventually moves out of the maritime continent, maybe back out across the Western Pacific Ocean. And when you're outside of that circle there, that means the Madden Julian oscillation is more active. And this is the GFS on the right versus the European on or GFS on the left, the European was on the right. So right now it is coming out across uh, what we're dealing with, maybe right across the Indian Ocean there. And again, you can see the phases two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then back to one as that Madden Julian oscillation moves across the equatorial Pacific. This is when it's moving out across the Pacific Ocean, then it moves out towards uh, Africa and then eventually back towards the uh, Indian Ocean. So they have some of these composites, like temperature composites, but you can see it, it, it's kind of an interesting signal when you look at phase one versus phase two. There's some of the Pacific Northwest starts to get bit more of a mixed bag. Phase three, cooler across the Pacific Northwest. Phase four, cooler across much of the entire Western uh, portion of the lower 48. And then you get to five, more of a mixed bag. Phase six, you start to warm up, seven warming up, and then eight, a better signal there. But also when you look at the significance, it doesn't always correlate perfectly. So you know, just because it's warmer than normal and a lot of times we, that we are in phase eight, it doesn't line up that well. So it is not a perfect prediction tool. We're still in our initial understandings of the Madden-Julian oscillation, what kind of effects and teleconnections it has downstream. So that's why I don't get too caught up in trying to forecast the Madden-Julian oscillation when we're dealing with some of these storms here because it is not that significant always. So again, we talked about that. We're going to skip past that. And again, I mentioned this in the Rossby wave configuration there. So just trying to drive home that point here uh, that these do have the effects on the high pressures and the troughs and then the ridges downstream across the planet. So where are we now? This is what everybody wants to know. Now, this is July 2025. Actually, this is August 3rd. I should make a correction on that there. But I did pull this most recent updated one. We are now in Nino 3. 0.4 looking at 0. Point, or negative 0. 0.3 celsius so we are now cooler than normal there across the equatorial pacific looks like we're headed down towards la nina conditions there you can see our did we make it to La Nina last year? Well, maybe, maybe not. It was right on the borderline there, but you can see the temperatures dr did drop down in December towards January. And this is where we were last year as we moved into the new year and then into February. Then we went up towards the neutral conditions and the models were like, hey, we're going to be in neutral, weak El Nino, weak La Nina. We don't know quite yet. But now the models are starting to become a, a hair more clear on what is coming up here. But we are dropping those temperatures down across the equatorial Pacific. Again, Nino 3.4 is right there there 120 and 170 west there's the hawaiian islands or south america there's mexico and australia to the bottom left so now this is the climate prediction center and so probabilities this is what was going on in june as we went through november december and january see neutral was the odds on favor right around 50 percent or so with la nina in a close second there right around 40 percent but look at the flip there october november december 50 50 chance there for la nina conditions there's also a very small chance there for el nino condition but you can see it's either probably going to be la nina or neutral conditions but you can see how we've bumped up those la nina odds and when I say La Nina, a lot of the skiers here for the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia kind of perk up. You're like, hey, you better snow up in the mountains and maybe some better chances for some snow into the lower elevations, maybe a bit more rain, you know, cooler than normal temperatures, and good stuff for the mossbacks. But if we look at June versus August here, you can see it's still not much of a change here. The CFS forecast looking pretty similar, but you can see that cold water tongue there. Look to the bottom right here, and I'm pointing out this line of blue that's across the Equatorial Pacific. So that's what it's going to look like as we go through October, November, December, January, February, and then on in towards the next year in the springtime there, March. 
So yeah, again, we're flirting right along that line of being in La Nina conditions. So this will become a little bit more clear as we go on in through August, September, and on in through October. So if we take a look at what the European was showing back in April, on April 1st, look at this. We're bouncing around neutral is what I showed you. And then look at the the. A European was like, hey, we're going to be in a warm neutral or maybe even in an El Nino on April 1st. But on August 1st, it's definitely changed its mind. We're still hanging around neutral conditions, but we are now dropping towards a cool neutral conditions as we speak. And then maybe down towards La Nina and you can kind of see it bouncing around on the cool side of things there as we go on in through the fall and the winter months. So again, the European kind of flipping from that warmer neutral El Nino back down towards cooler neutral and possibly La Nina conditions, which lines up with the other models. Now, this is something fun to look at here as well. This is what I usually show, but we have the 2024 and 2025 season where we got 2.8. I marked it as neutral officially because I don't think we quite made the threshold for La Nina, but it was close. We got 2.8 inches, uh, inches of snowfall for SeaTac. And something interesting I always like to point out is that when you look at that, so we have six years, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Since 1950, there have been eight years with zero snowfall. Can you guess which uh, phase we were in? That's right. It was El Nino. So every single time that we got zero, it's been El Nino. There's also been some other really low, but just because you're in El Nino doesn't automatically mean it's a slam dunk of very low snowfall totals. In fact, some of our snowiest years, this extreme solutions here, uh, 1968, 1969. I know a lot of people remember this one. I know my mom does. I wasn't alive yet then, but I wish I could have been alive during uh, the that winter because a very exceptional snowfall amount. So Again, this isn't a perfect indicator here, but basically what I'm trying to show you is the La Nina years are favored for lower elevation snowfall versus El Nino. However, we were in a weak El Nino December, uh, February, sorry, of 2019. I know a lot of people across Pacific Northwest do indeed remember that very snowy February here. And uh, as back December 2008, I know a lot of people remember that one as well. 23.3 inches in that season. That was a La Nina year. So yeah. And you can also see our weak El Nino in 2023 and 2024 only yielded 0.3 inches of snowfall. And then you can see we had no snowfall in 15, 16. That was El Nino, 2009, 10, nothing. 2002, three, nothing. Way back in 91, 92, nothing. So yeah, some of these El Nino years, you can really get skunked. But again, we are headed probably towards a cool neutral or La Nina. And you see, we have the triple dip La Nina from 2021. 22 and on in through 23 where we did get some decent snowfalls in those three years um but yeah so uh, we just looked at this a little bit of a closer look at this uh more recently but now i want to get on to show you what it we showed back in july so this is going to be updated again so i'll do another video here probably in the next 10 days or so but this is for july and you can see september october november not much to show you here above normal across a lot of the lower 48 and kind of a equal chance signal there across the Pacific Northwest. But if we go on to um, October, November, December, again, kind of a mixed bag here across Pacific Northwest, some above normal across the interior portions, but equal chances. But look at that. We start to get that signal as we go through November for some above average precipitation. And if you didn't know, we are in um, a pretty severe drought here across much of the Pacific Northwest. So we could really use this precipitation. Let's just hope it doesn't come too fast and furious. And then we go to December, January, February. Look at this starting to show up for portions of Washington and Oregon. Still a mixed bag there with precipitation, but look at that below low normal starting to creep in there as we go through December and January and February of 2025 all the way on into 2026. And that's to be expected with a potential La Nina year coming up. That below normal signal, January, February, March of 2026, and that above normal signal there for some precipitation, February, March, and April. These are a different three-month period that I did show you here because it gets towards the above normal, and I just wanted to show you guys that. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm still dealing with some issues with my channel. Hopefully it'll be cleared up in the next week or so. Google has an automatic thing where it just automatically locks you out for seven days um, if it thinks something has been going on because they can't verify for sure 100% that I am the owner of the YouTube channel apparently and they want to make sure that everything is on the up and up and I think it's just something to do with their computer system says hey now you have to wait seven days before you can get back in there and start to change things so I'm waiting for that that I'll, I'm going to try again to log in next Friday otherwise I'll be posting things on this uh, channel here uh, Pacific Northwest 
weather. I took off the watch here because obviously you can't have dupli duplicate channels. But anyway, let me know what you guys think. I'll post this tonight. Um, hope you guys are having a good day. Otherwise, I'll do my normal briefing here tomorrow and I will see you then.